Hello lovelies, I'm True Crime Caitlin and welcome back to my channel and another True Crime Case. If you're new here, welcome and thank you so much for joining us. If you're interested in true crime, please make sure to subscribe and hit the little bell button so that you'll be notified every time I upload a brand new true crime case. I also cover true crime cases over on my TikTok account. You can find the link for that in the description box below. Today's case is one that since I first heard about it back in 2019, I've never been able to get it off my mind. How can a doting father and a loving husband annihilate his whole family all for one girl. Today I'm going to talk about the Watts family case in a way that you may have never heard it before, including talking about their early life, early dating, jailhouse confessions, letters written by Chris and much more. Before continuing to listen, please check the description box below for my disclaimer and for any trigger warnings. On the 16th of May 1985, Christopher Lee Watts was born in Fayetteville, North Carolina. He is the second child of Cindy and Ronnie Watts and little brother to Jamie Watts, his sister. They were considered an upper middle class family. Ronnie worked at a car dealership and Cindy worked in finance. They were a very close knit family and Chris would bond with his dad over their love of cars. People would say that Chris even began to mirror his dad's personality, being very respectful, quiet, soft-spoken and friendly. The family attended the Baptist church where Chris was sort of instilled with a fear of God. He was really worried about upsetting God and being sent to hell and Cindy would say that she often heard Chris repenting when he thought he had sinned. At school, Chris would keep his head down and focus on his work, meaning that he usually got really good grades. Through his childhood and his teenage years, he only really had two friends and they all stuck together and were actually friends for many years after graduating. In his teenage years, he was very socially awkward and he didn't really know how to develop friendships and relationships. He never had a girlfriend and like I say, he only really had those two friends. When his friends would go to school dances or house parties, Chris would almost always stay at home either reading, watching TV or spending time with his grandmother who he absolutely adored. After graduating, Chris was set on achieving his dream of working on car engines for NASCAR, which is like sports and racing cars. Sadly, he didn't pass and didn't manage to get onto the circuit, but he didn't dwell and instead just moved on. Chris began working and was really good with his money, meaning that he managed to get his own apartment, he built up his own set of tools which were worth around 25 grand and he spent a lot of time thinking about his future. He was really excited at the idea of finding the woman of his dreams and getting married and he just couldn't wait to be a dad. But much like his teenage years, Chris was still very socially awkward as a young adult and didn't form any relationships. He actually really struggled with this. In 2010, when a cousin of Chris's mentioned that she knew someone that Chris might like, he just blew it off until this cousin showed him a picture of a woman named Shanann Ruzek. When Chris saw the picture, he was blown away. He commented saying that Shanann was the most beautiful girl he had ever seen and took straight to Facebook to send her a friend request. Shanann Catherine Rosek was born on the 10th of January 1984. Two years later, her little brother Frankie, who she was extremely close to, was born. Their parents are Frank, who had his own business, doing home improvements, and their mum is Sandra, who just goes by Sandy, and she worked in a hair salon. Growing up, Shanann was quite a quiet and insecure girl, and sadly was the target of bullies. Frankie would intervene whenever he could to protect his sister, often resulting in him getting in a lot of fights. It wasn't until joining the drama club that Shanann really started to blossom and she gained so much confidence. She'd done all the work backstage, making sure that everything was perfect. She often spent hours after school staying behind to help make props and paint backgrounds, etc. She was extremely close with her drama teacher and she would often confide in him about her struggles, her worries and her home life. Shanann radiated this glow of happy energy energy. She never excluded anyone, never made anyone feel left out and she was sort of the mother of her friendship group. 
We all had a mother of the friendship group and that was me. One of her friends recalled a time when they were all eating dinner together and he accidentally spilled his drink onto his trousers. He felt humiliated because it looked like he had wet himself and Shanann saying this, knowing how he's feeling, took her drink and poured it on herself. The whole group were in fits of laughter and eventually everyone had each other's drinks all over them. Shanann had met a man named Leonard in her final year of school who she thought was the love of her life and not long after graduating the pair got married. Their relationship was rocky. Shanann was brought up by very hard workers so in turn she was a hard worker herself and during their marriage she ran two stores as the manager and she would often spend many late nights if not all night working. This amongst many other things really put a strain on the marriage so the pair ended up going through a pretty awful divorce. She would say this divorce took everything from her her happiness, her confidence, her drive, but she fought to get that all back. Her dream had always been to build her own house and at only 25 years old, she did just that and the house was absolutely amazing. It had 12 rooms, four bed, four bath, and then it had a balcony which overlooked Lake Wiley. This was one of Shanann's biggest accomplishments and she worked her backside off to get it. Sadly, she couldn't really enjoy her new home for long. She went from being very happy and energetic to just being poorly all the time. Her hair began to fall out, she gained nearly two stone in a month and she was just miserable. This was when she was diagnosed with lupus. Lupus is a long-term condition that causes joint pain, skin rashes and tiredness. This is when she was at her absolute lowest point and this also happened to be when Chris had sent her that friend request. She accepted the friend request thinking that they were never going to meet and initially she ignored messages from Chris until one day she thought what the heck and then they began talking. Chris and Shanann ended up meeting and I don't think that Shanann was really feeling them at first. He was being his usual self, being quite reserved and a bit awkward and they just didn't have that instant click. Shanann pushed him away, rejected him over and over, gave him many opportunities to walk away. But Chris was persistent, he really liked Shanann and he wanted to see her and get to know her. Their first date didn't really go massively well. They had arranged to meet up at a posh theatre and Shanann got so excited, she got all dressed up in a really nice dress and then when Chris turned up he was wearing camouflage cargo trousers so not really dressed for the occasion at all. Throughout the date Chris rarely spoke and apparently it was really awkward. I think coming out of that date Chris knew that his chances with Shanann were slipping because they really just weren't clicking but in his own words, he was persistent in trying to pursue her. So he invited her to a more casual setting date and asked her if she would go to a concert with him. I do think that Shanann must have really wanted to give Chris a chance or liked him a little bit because after all these awkward meetings and awkward dates, they ended up going on a third date. They went on a trip to Myrtle Beach and at one point Shanann was overcome with pain due to a flare up from her lupus and when Chris looked after her, showing her how kind and how caring he was, this is when she began to fall for him. Shanann would later talk about rejecting Chris over and over and she said, quote, but he stuck around and he stuck around because he was the one for me. Shanann would always continuously praise Chris and in another post she said really lovely things such as, quote, I couldn't have asked God for a better man. Chris's family from the get-go weren't really taken by Shanann. In a book that I read, Sandy talks about Cindy and Jamie visiting Shanann's house for the first time and they were really negative, kind of doubting how Shanann could afford this. And it seemed that they weren't really keen on Shanann enjoying this quite extravagant lifestyle. Chris went on to romantically propose to Shanann on a beach. He had invited both of their families there to witness him declaring his love for Shanann. When planning the engagement party, Jamie had asked Shanann if there was a job that she could do, if there's anything that she could do to help, so Shanann offered her the job of doing the invitations. On the day of the party, not a lot of people showed up, which really shocked Shanann because she had invited quite a lot of people, so she went on to ring up some people to kind of ask why they didn't show up, and that's when she was informed that a lot 
lot of the people didn't receive invitations. This made her really upset with Jamie because Jamie had asked if there was a job she could do, she wanted to help, but then didn't bother sending most of the invitations out. Jamie does deny this though and said that she did send out all of the invites. Chris and Shanann both asked Jamie if she would like to be their bridesmaid for their wedding and then have Jamie's daughter, Chris's niece, be the flower girl and seeming delighted, she accepted. One week before the wedding, Shanann had arranged for the whole bridal party to go to a spa, do a little bit relaxing, a bit of pampering, get their nails done and Jamie didn't show up. She said that she didn't go because she couldn't get out of work but for Shanann who was really trying with her sister-in-law this really upset her so she turned around and said just don't bother to come to the wedding. On the 3rd of November 2012 Chris and Shanann were married and they had a beautiful wedding, gorgeous reception and Chris's parents and Jamie didn't go even though Shanann had only said to Jamie to not bother coming but I mean for me she probably has only said that out of anger like if Jamie showed up she wasn't going to kick her out that's what I think anyways during their party Frank does a speech where he says quote I couldn't have asked for a better man for her he makes her smile she makes him smile god bless you both Shanann's family really took Chris in with open arms and accepted him and they were just so happy that he had now put a smile back on Shanann's face. In 2013, after visiting, both Chris and Shanann just fell in love with Colorado. So they made the leap and they bought a five bedroom house in Frederick, Colorado. The newlyweds began building their family and shortly after the wedding, Shanann fell pregnant. This was a miracle because Shanann had been told that she couldn't have kids which was heartbreaking for her because she was one of these people who was born to be a mother and now that she was pregnant and she was going to have her own baby she was just beaming. On the 17th of December 2013 Bella Marie Watts was born. On the 17th of July 2015 their family grew once again when they welcomed their second daughter Celeste Catherine Watts into the world. Celeste was nicknamed Cece, so that's what I'm going to call her throughout today's video. After Cece was born, Shanann started working from home so that she could be there more for her girls. She worked for the company Lavelle selling a product called Thrive. Thrive was a weight loss and nutrition supplement in the form of vitamins, shakes and patches. Lavelle was basically like what we would know as an MLM and Shanann was really good at this job. She had over 200 people working below her. Shanann got so high up in the company that both she and Chris were sent off on work trips, work holidays and Shanann even won a car which was a white Lexus. She used her Facebook account to kind of help boost our sales and she was doing what a lot of influencers these days do. She was sharing all aspects of her life to her followers. She was sharing the products, what they do, their results. And she really drew people in. She was very much a people person and she just loved sharing her life with everyone. She would post selfies of herself wearing the Thrive patches and then pictures of Chris wearing them too. Chris loved the Thrive patches, they helped him lose around seven stone and he was always wearing at least one but most of the time he wore two. He and Shanann also enjoyed the shakes and Shanann would post videos of them making them and trying different flavours. Chris is still very much an introvert so in these videos it is mainly Shanann kind of talking and connecting with people and Chris is kind of there in the background. A lot of these videos you can go and watch on Shanann's Facebook account which is still up. From her account many people got the impression that the Wattses were the perfect all-American family. Chris was a Dorton dad and a dedicated husband, they lived a lavish lifestyle and the pair were madly in love. On the 11th of June 2018 Shanann surprises Chris with her third pregnancy. Having another baby is something that the couple have spoke about and after having two girls, Chris really, really wanted to have a little boy so Shanann was really hoping that this third baby could be a boy for him. She sets up a phone and films Chris's reaction to the announcement. 
she's wearing a grey top which has the writing oops we did it again on when chris walks into the room he pauses while he reads the t-shirt and as it kind of registers what the t-shirt says and what it means he begins to smile and laugh he tells shanann he likes that shirt looking at the pregnancy test chris is smiling and he says quote that's awesome i guess when you want it to it happens wow despite how i just described it the video sounds quite cute however when you watch it it just seems a bit awkward i don't know it's just my opinion but i just think it seems a little bit off six days later on father's day shanann dedicates a post to chris she uploads a collage of pictures captioning it quote chris we are so incredibly blessed to have you you do so much every day for us and take such great care of us you are the reason I was brave enough to agree to number three. From laundry to kids showers, you are incredible and we are so lucky to have you in our life. Happy Father's Day. At some point in June, and it's not really known exactly when, Chris develops a wandering eye and sets his sight on Nicole Kessinger. She worked for Anadarko Petroleum, which is where Chris also worked. She would get her dinner from the fridge in the staff room and this is the first time Chris lays eyes on her. One day he plucks up the courage to go to our office and introduce himself. Nicole said that she noticed Chris didn't wear a wedding ring so that's why she even entertained speaking to him and getting a norm in the first place. They would begin to send flirty emails to each other and by the next month they were already meeting up outside of work. It was shortly after this that a strain on Shanann and Chris's marriage began. And like I say, I'm not sure when this whole thing with Nicole started, but I lean towards it starting the beginning of June because Chris's reaction to this new pregnancy just seems off and imagine what's going through his head. He's met someone at work, he's in the very early stages of an affair, and now his wife is announcing a pregnancy to him. I bet that that news just floored him. On the 27th of June, Shanann takes Bella and Cece for a six week long vacation to North Carolina so that they can go and visit family and friends. Halfway through their trip, Shanann takes the girls to Chris's parents' house and a massive argument breaks out. Cece had a tree nut allergy and anyone with any sort of nut allergy knows how serious and how fatal these allergies can be. Cindy had bought ice cream which had tree nuts inside and Shanann had asked Cindy to keep it out the way to not let Cece go near it but instead of putting it out the way supposedly Cindy had said that this was a good time to teach Cece that she can't always get what she wants so Cece had to sit and watch the other kids enjoy the ice cream. Shanann burst in fury when she saw that Cece was in close proximity to the ice cream and she shouted at Cindy saying that she was trying to kill her. They had a huge argument which resulted in Cindy kicking Shanann out of the house and Shanann swore that she wasn't going to go back. That's just kind of the gist of the argument. Obviously everyone there has different recollections so that's just kind of the thick of what I could gather. After being kicked out, Shanann had texted Chris and said to him, you've got to ring your dad and get this straightened out and Chris sided with Shanann. He also wasn't happy with what had gone on. Cindy would later say that she had no idea about Cece's allergy but supposedly Shanann had pre-warned Cindy about the allergy and asked her to clear the house of anything with trainers inside. While in North Carolina, Cece celebrated her third birthday and Shanann had thrown her a little birthday party. Despite the arguments, she obviously invited Cece's grandparents. She invited Cindy and Ronnie to the party, but they didn't show up. I think that this is incredibly sad. Obviously, Cindy and Ronnie had no idea that this would be Cece's last party and it would be their last chance to celebrate with her. But just the fact that they had let their disagreement and let's face it, their dislike of Shanann interfere with them seeing their granddaughter. For the first five weeks that Shanann is in North Carolina, Chris spends the bulk of his time with Nicole, seeing her about four or five times a week. And this is when they began a physical relationship. 
by now Nicole knew that Chris was married and that he'd had two daughters but Chris had told her that he and Shanann were in the process of separating so Nicole accepted that. Chris didn't tell Nicole that Shanann was currently pregnant and she's always proclaimed that she didn't know about the pregnancy until much later on but I am going to tell you something a little bit later that might make you question this. Because Chris is spending all of this time with Nicole, his communication with Shanann is virtually non-existent. He ignores most of our text messages, pretty much all of our phone calls, and for Shanann, who has only ever experienced this with Chris once, this is very confusing. The only other time where Chris had kind of shut her out and gone a little bit quiet on her like this is shortly after they got married, but supposedly that was because of Chris's parents. But he had never been like that since, and he was always so attentive of Tishanan and would never ignore her, never mind ignoring FaceTime calls from Bella and Cece. On the 4th of July, Chris spends the night over at Nicole's house and has ignored Shanann's messages all day. He sleeps late into the next day and when he wakes up and checks his phone, he sees that he has masses of missed calls and he just knows Shanann's going to be mad. He steps outside and rings Shanann back, giving her a shitty excuse saying that the heat had drained him so he fell asleep as soon as he came home. But as he suspected, Shanann isn't happy. After this phone call, he decides he's just going to head home so he goes back into the house and tells Nicole this and now it's her turn not to be happy because she thought they were going to spend that day together. When he told her no that he was just going to go home this is when the penny dropped for Nicole and she realises that she wasn't a priority for Chris and she began to grow jealous. She later shows up at Chris's house unannounced and uninvited and says that she's only coming because she wants to help him draft up a healthy meal plan. On the 7th of July Chris and Nicole have a two minute phone call and then for the rest of the afternoon into the evening Chris's phone connects to a lot of different routers from different restaurants and bars so it's safe to assume that maybe they had gone out together that night. After again ignoring Shanann all day, the next day he texts her apologising, saying that he'd fallen asleep and that he loves her so much. Shanann questioned him, asking is he okay and she expressed that he's making her feel like he doesn't want to talk to her. Chris apologises, reassures Shanann, just tells her that he's got a lot going on at work, they've given him a lot more responsibilities and tells her that he loves her to the moon and back. Shanann replies saying that she loves him, misses him and she just wishes her husband wanted to talk to her. On the 14th of July, Chris takes Nicole on a date to a car museum and something that happened that day, potentially on that date, made Chris decide that he didn't want the life that he had now, he wanted a life with Nicole. He spoke to Shanann that night, one of the only times he bothered to speak to her, and just flat out came out and said that he didn't want to be with her and that he didn't want this new baby. This was absolutely devastating for Shanann. She had felt the shift in the relationship and she tried to ask Chris what was going on but he completely shut her out and now seemingly out of nowhere he's telling her that he doesn't want to be with her anymore. Along with devastation, Shanann felt confusion. Only weeks before she's announced her new pregnancy to Chris, a pregnancy that they had spoke about and that Chris had wanted and now he's changed his mind and she's already 12 weeks pregnant. Shanann suggests going to therapy or marriage counselling and he point blank refuses. On the 17th, Nicole is again at the Watts' house and this time she really takes in the place and the life that Chris has. There's framed happy family pictures on the wall, there's framed achievements on the wall and he's in a beautiful home. So she asks Chris, quote, you have all this, more than most people and we are doing this. Why are we doing this? Are you willing to give all this up? Is your relationship with your wife that bad? He tells Nicole that yes it is and this is when Chris says he told her about the pregnancy. Nicole would later say that she still didn't know about the pregnancy at this point but according to Chris after he told her about the pregnancy on this day she went absolutely berserk and she screamed at him quote what the are you doing with me then? Before storming out the house, slamming the door and then going and sitting in our truck. 
Chris would later admit that this whole tantrum that Nicole threw really turned him on and they went back to Nicole's house and had sex many times. While there they took sexy pictures and nudes of each other and Nicole forwarded them on to Chris the next day. He saved the photos in a secret app where it looks like a calculator but you type in a certain code and then it kind of unlocks so he had transferred the pictures onto that app. On the 24th, Shanann texts Chris and tells him that she's realised what the problem is in their marriage. The problem is that there are only one-sided feelings and they're coming from Shanann. She tells Chris that she can't come back to Colorado with the state that their relationship is currently in and she's almost begging Chris to meet her halfway. Chris half asses a response like many of his others, he's sorry and he loves her. Shanann took this as an opportunity to properly vent and probably blow off a little bit steam and she expressed to Chris how she was feeling. She said, quote, I try to give you space, but while you are working out and living the bachelor life, I'm carrying our third and fighting with our two kids daily, trying to work and make money. It's not hard texting, I love you and miss you. If you don't mean it, then I get it, but we need to talk. That same day, Nicole is Googling, man I'm having an affair with says he will leave his wife. This is one of many weird and shady Google searches made by Nicole and I'll talk a little bit more about the others at the end of the video. Chris also takes to Google the following day and searches things such as when to say I love you in a new relationship and how does it feel when someone says I love you. These are searches being made by a married man. Surely he should know how it feels when someone says that they love you. On the 28th, Chris and Nicole go on a date to some sand dunes where these infamous photos were taken. Nicole records a video for Chris where she says, quote, I'm having a wonderful time. You mean a lot to me and I'm glad you're having a blast. She ends the video by blowing him a kiss. As planned, Chris flies out to North Carolina on the 31st of July. He's planned to spend a week there so he can see friends and family and then he's flying back to Colorado with Shanann, Bella and Cece. Before leaving, he gives Nicole this love letter. Shanann waits for Chris at the airport and as he comes down the escalator, she begins filming to capture Chris's reunion with Bella and Cece and it feels off. Bella and Cece run to their dad who they haven't seen and have barely spoke to in five weeks and they are so excited to see him. So they run up and give him a massive hug. Chris kind of leans down and gives them a small squeeze but he doesn't, you know, pick them up or anything like that. He's not really showing any excitement to seeing his girls again. It's not until he's further down the corridor that he finally kneels down and properly embraces Bella and Cece. He gives Shanann a very small hug and a quick peck and that's it. On Chris's first night in North Carolina, Shanann complains that she's got a bit of a headache so Chris offers to go and get her some painkillers to help relieve the pain. But instead of getting her some paracetamol or anything like that, he gives her 80 mg of oxycodone. Oxycodone is a painkiller but for extreme pain and it's advised that while pregnant you don't take this. He admitted to giving her this in such a high dosage in hope that it would cause her to have a miscarriage. Chris firmly believed that it would be easier for him to have this life with Nicole if there wasn't a third baby involved. Just think about how sick that is. Chris is poisoning his pregnant wife in hopes that it'll kill his unborn son just to try and please this new woman in his life. That's disgusting, it's just so unthinkable. The oxycodone did make Shanann feel very nauseous and she was up most of the night vomiting. Her family would later comment that she was totally fine and healthy her whole time in North Carolina up until that first night with Chris. Shanann had sort of a signal that she would use in order to show Chris that she wanted to have sex and this signal was taking a night shower. So one night she steps in the shower doing the signal in hopes of getting some affection and intimacy from Chris. After stepping out of the shower she kind of goes to Chris and he blows her off, he rejects her, he doesn't want to get intimate with her, instead he wants to get on the floor and start doing push-ups. 
tips. Shanann text one of our friends relaying what had just happened and she was so upset and in the messages she said that she just wanted to cry. She didn't understand how after five weeks apart he wasn't all over her. Instead he was being distant, cold, showing no affection, not being touchy-feely, lovey-dovey like how he usually is and this is when she first says he must be getting it from somewhere else. Throughout his time in North Carolina, Chris is in constant communication with Nicole. She sends him more nude photos that he stores in the calculator app. He would later say that it was while he was here, away from Nicole and with his family, that he decided what he had to do. He knew he couldn't have the best of both worlds and in his mind, in order to live peacefully with Nicole, he had to get rid of his family. While Chris was in North Carolina, back in Colorado, Nicole had been searching and looking at wedding dresses one night for over two hours. When the Wattses arrive back in Colorado, Shanann is updating several of her friends about this whole situation with Chris. She seems in slightly better spirits because they had spoken a little bit more on their way home, but he still wasn't his normal self. On their first night back, Shanann tries to again get intimate with Chris and sadly again he rejects her, which causes Shanann to just have a massive breakdown. She bursts into tears and just flat out asks Chris, who is he sleeping with? I'm not sure exactly when, but when he came back from North Carolina, at one point Chris went to Nicole's house and on arrival she presented him with a key to her house. This shows that Nicole believes that her relationship with Chris is getting more serious and this is her kind of cementing her intentions of wanting a serious relationship with Chris. The day after arriving back from North Carolina on the 8th of August, Shanann and Chris go to an ultrasound appointment to see their baby. Chris is described as being indifferent at the appointment. He's not really shown any interest and virtually no excitement at all. During the appointment, Shanann lovingly puts her arm out trying to embrace her husband but Chris pulls away from her. Shanann again vented to her friends about her very serious worry of being a single mum to three and how she could never afford it in Colorado and how most importantly she desperately wanted to fix things and make things work with Chris. On this night, Shanann brings up to Chris how he's been treating her and how he's been making her feel that he's been given her the cold shoulder and she wanted to sit and talk it out and solve it out but he didn't want to. He instead took himself downstairs, waited until he knew Shanann was sleeping and went on the phone to Nicole. He went on to sleep in the basement and he would do this for the next couple of nights. When they were eventually told that their baby was a boy, Shanann was overjoyed. Chris really wanted a boy and now she was carrying their son, so maybe she thought that this could help build a bridge and help fix their relationship. The name that was decided for their son was Nico Lee. There is a lot of speculation about who chose the name. A lot of people speculate that it was Chris and that he had chose Nico Lee because of how similar it sounds to his mistress's name, Nicole. And on this day, when they find this out, Nicole is again taken to Google and searches marrying your mistress. Shanann had again confronted Chris trying to get out of him what was up, what was going on, what was wrong, but he never gave. She spoke to her friends and said that the only thing that had happened was that big argument with Cindy and with Chris denying that Shanann had done anything wrong and denying there being someone else, this is the only thing that Shanann could think was wrong in the relationship. Shanann thought it must have been the argument that caused the rift. So she tried to make amends and she texted Chris's parents a picture of the ultrasound introducing their baby boy and they ignored her. Shanann was due to be traveling to Arizona with her company Lavelle for a training conference workshop type thing, but she was considering canceling the trip because of this whole shift and rift with Chris. She really wanted to stay home and sort everything out. 
Chris, however, convinced her to go, promising her that when she came back, they would sit down, they would talk through everything and they would fix it. In reality, Chris just saw this as another opportunity to spend time with Nicole. Before leaving to go to Arizona, Shanann had asked Chris if she bought a couple's counselling book off Amazon, would he consider sitting reading it? And he said, yes, I will. But when the package arrived, he didn't even open it and take it out of the baggage. He just put it straight in the bin. Before leaving, Shanann leaves Chris a handwritten note where she is basically pouring her heart out to him. I'll pop it on the screen now so that you can pause to read it. There's a sentence that really stuck out to me on the first page where she wrote, quote, our daughter's life cannot be replaced. The reason that it really stuck with us is because by the time Shanann had wrote those very true words, Chris had already decided that he was going to kill them. The next morning, which is the 10th of August, Shanann, who is in Arizona, sends Chris a text message saying, quote, I miss and love you so much. I'm still in shock we're having a little boy. I'm so excited and happy. Thank you for letting me hold you this morning. It felt good. Your letter is on the counter. She hasn't even been gone for 24 hours before Chris is arranging to get Bella and Cece babysat so that he can go out with Nicole. He takes her to a restaurant called The Lazy Dog where they run up a bill of $63 and for the first ever time, Chris pays using his bank card which has his shared account with Shanann on. Ordinarily, any other time, Chris would pay using gift cards so that Shanann couldn't see, but this time he didn't. He used the bank card. This just shows that at this point, he is not even bothered or trying to hide the affair anymore, and this is very pleasing to Nicole. Shanann obviously saw the transaction and called Chris because she was confused. He had told her that he was going out to a baseball game, but here on their bank, it shows that he's at a restaurant and he's run up a high bill, so it just doesn't make sense. She rang Chris to ask about it. Chris told her that he was out with some friends and that he had ate salmon and he got a beer. And Shanann pulled up the menu of the Lazy Dog and tallied up how much his bill should have been for having salmon and a beer. So his bill should have been $30, so where's the other half of the bill. After their date, Chris went back to Nicole's house and he would later say that they done things that he is very ashamed of and that he will take to his grave. I don't know what that means. Is, is that something sexual? Is it them discussing or planning the upcoming murders or is it something else completely? Chris was very vague with this. Another thing he said was after this, he knew for definite that he wasn't going back to Shanann and he wasn't going to rekindle anything with her. He gets back home to the babysitter and the girls at 10.30 p.m. He was half an hour late. On the 12th of August, the last full day of Bella and Cece's life, they had a very fun-filled day. They watched some cartoons, they then went shopping for a birthday present for a party that they were attending on the afternoon. At the party, they had tons of fun playing with water balloons and Chris sat and watched on knowing inside that this was going to be the last party that his daughters ever attended. They ate leftover pizza for their dinner and then they FaceTimed with Frank who would later say that there was nothing different about Chris at all when they were on the call. But Chris was different. He wasn't being attentive to Bella and Cece how he usually would be. He didn't bother to take towels to the party knowing that they were going to get wet. He was short-tempered with them and he admitted that Everything they done that day just irritated him, which is something he would never have said about his girls before. All day, he is obviously texting back and forth with Nicole, giving her his full attention rather than his daughters. Chris would describe the activities of their final day by saying they had a quote, epic time. On the night, he then bathed the girls, read them a bedtime story, and took them into bed for the last time. In Chris's own words, he speaks about this saying, quote, August 12th, when I finished putting my girls to bed, I walked away and said, that's the last time I'm ever going to be tucking my babies in. I knew what was going to happen the whole day before 
and I did nothing to stop it. That night, he spent almost two hours on the phone in a call, and according to Chris, they were having phone sex, but according to Nicole, she doesn't remember what they spoke about. Shanann's flight back home from Arizona was delayed, which was frustrating. Ordinarily, on these work trips, Shanann was the life and soul of the party. She was so happy and energetic, but on this trip, she just seemed like a shell of herself. Her friend said that she had been really down the whole trip, she was crying, she wasn't eating, and she just wasn't the normal Shanann. I can imagine that after everything she's gone through the past few weeks, Shanann just wants to get home and get her marriage back on track and be happy again. All these feelings that pregnant Shanann must have been feeling would have totally exhausted her. A six week vacation where she's practically begging her husband to communicate with her. Chris telling her that they weren't compatible anymore, that he didn't want her, that he didn't want the baby anymore, just his straight up coldness, his lack of love and affection, and then her worries about his infidelity, all that is enough to wear anyone down. I just really feel for Shanann at this moment in time because I can't imagine how she would have been feeling inside. She rings Chris from the airport to update him that her flight's going to be delayed, she's going to be home a little bit later and she generally just wants to chat with her husband. Chris however is more interested in getting a workout in than talking to Shanann. Chris later said that he was angry that Shanann's flight was delayed because he was pumped, he was hyping himself up to annihilate his family. They small talk over text, Shanann asking Chris if he wants anything to go with his tea the next night, if she should pick anything up when she's out, and he asks for broccoli and green beans. She again vents to one of our friends explaining this situation, and one of the text messages that our friend sent just sends a shiver down my spine. The friend reassured Shanann that she is a brilliant wife and said, quote, he would kill for you. Shanann is dropped off at home by her friend Nicole Atkinson at 1.48am. She gets in, kicks off her flip-flops at the door, pops her head in her Bella and Cece's room, chucks off her clothes, sticks on a t-shirt and climbs into bed still wearing her makeup because she is just too tired to take it off. She hugs Chris and shows him a little bit of affection and miraculously he lets her and he hugs her back and they kiss and end up having sex. Shanann then eventually falls asleep. Chris explains in his own words his first attempt at murdering his daughters, saying, quote, August 13th, the morning of. I went to the girls' room first before Shanann and I had our argument. I went to Bella's room, then Cece's room and used a pillow on their bed to kill them. After feeling satisfied that he had murdered his babies, Chris then turns around, goes back into the bedroom, wakes up Shanann and instigates an argument with her, telling her that it's over, that it's never ever going to work. Apparently Shanann argued back, saying that he would never see Bella or Cece again, and this is when Chris puts his hands around Shanann's neck and begins to strangle her. Chris remembers having no control over his actions at this point. He knew that if he released his grip, Shanann would live, but in his mind, Shanann is not a person anymore. She is just an obstacle in the way of his life with Nicole, and in his mind, she needs to be eliminated. He remembers Shanann's mascara running from her eyes and smearing across her face. He remembers watching her eyes fill with blood. Shanann looked her husband in the eyes as he was killing her, and the last sentence that she ever heard was Chris telling her that he didn't love her. He knew that Shanann was dead when she had defecated. Chris was aghast when he turned and seen that Bella and Cece had walked into the room, that they had survived. Chris described Bella saying that she had bruises around her eyes and that they both looked like they had been seriously hurt. In his own words, Chris said, quote, I was wrapping her up in the bed sheet when the girls came into the room. I don't know how it could be possible, but they were both up and walking around. I knew that if Nikki and I were going to be together, I had to kill all of them. Bella asked her dad what was wrong with mommy, 
and Chris assured her that mommy was going to be okay. Chris lay Shanann's wrapped body on the floor and slid her down the stairs. Apparently she was too heavy for him to carry. He left her body lay on the floor by the door as he ran outside to go and get his truck. He later expressed that at this moment in time, he felt furious that Bella and Cece had survived that they were running around the house, that they were crying, they were whimpering, they were continuously asking if their mum was okay. He was angry that his plan at killing his daughters first didn't work. He had wanted to protect them from seeing everything that he was doing, but he failed. And he said he had no interest in consoling his distressed daughters. Chris also later said that in this moment, he believed that the girl's surviving was one of many warning signs that he experienced from God, urging him to stop, but Chris either couldn't or didn't want to. I know which I think it is. At around 5.15 a.m., Chris is seen on a neighbour's CCTV pulling up his truck and loading it. Shanann's body is dragged to the back seat where she is placed on the floor alongside bags of rubbish. Chris also loaded the truck with a shovel, a rake, a gas can and his dinner for work. He then went back into the house and told the girls to follow him and get into the truck. Poor Bella tried to protest, telling her dad that they needed the car seats. She knew that it wasn't safe being in the back of the car without the car seats, but Chris assured her that it would be fine just this one time. It breaks my heart that poor Bella had thought about hers and her sister's safety asking for the car seats when their dad was actually driving them to their death. Chris is driving his dead wife and two daughters to an oil site that he knows through his job. The site is called Survey 319 and for the whole one hour drive there, Chris is sweating, he's shaking and holding on to his anger towards Bella and Cece for not being dead. At this moment in time, Chris considers his girls, quote, another thing to deal with. In the back seat, the girls could see their mother's wrapped body lay by their feet. They were whimpering, kind of drifting in and out of sleep. They were holding on to each other and comforting each other. When arriving at Survey 319, Chris first took out Shanann's body and lay her on the ground. He then went to the back of the truck and using her own comfort blanket, he smothered Cece by putting it over her head. He'd done this in front of Bella who was distraught. He carried Cece's body up the ladders to the oil tanks, opened one of the hatches and lowered her body in. As he lowered her tiny body into these huge tanks, he knew in his heart he would never see her again, but he felt no love for her and just let her drop, waiting to hear her body splash into the oil. Without any reluctance or hesitation, he went back down the ladders and headed towards Bella. She heartbreakingly cried to her dad, asking if he was going to do to her what he had just done to Cece. Using the same blanket, he began trying to smother Bella too, but was thrown off by how much she tried to fight back. Bella pleaded to Chris, saying, Daddy, no before he eventually killed her too. Disgustingly, Chris said that while he was carrying Bella's body up the ladders towards the oil tanks, he was empowered by his own strength. When opening the hatch on the other oil tank, Chris paused, kind of taking in how small the hatch actually was. It was only eight inches in diameter, meaning that when he tried to get Bella inside, he had to shove her arms and shoulders. Later, a little piece of blonde hair would be found on the hatch. He later admitted that he had put the girls in the oil tank so that they couldn't get up for a second time, so basically to make sure that they stayed dead. Chris then took to digging Shanann's shallow grave. He used a shovel and dug eight inches into the earth, thinking to himself how easy it was because all of the mud was loose. He then pulled on the sheet that Shanann was wrapped in and kind of just let her roll into the grave. She landed face down and he left her like that. After burying Shanann, a sense of freedom washed over Chris. 
he could now be with Nicole with no ties and no worries about anyone else and in this moment his love for her amplified. After callously killing his daughters and burying his whole family Chris quite calmly went to a shop and bought himself some breakfast. He went on to work where he acted as if it was just a totally normal day. His colleagues would say that there was nothing out of the ordinary with Chris and if they really had a nitpick, the only thing that was slightly different was that his clothes were a little bit ornate whereas usually Chris was very presentable when coming to work. At around 8.30am Chris rang Primrose Daycare which is the nursery that Bella and Cece attended. He unenrolled them, telling the person on the phone that they wouldn't be coming back. This immediately struck as a little bit odd as only recently Shanann had expressed how excited she was for the girls going back to nursery. After this call, he then contacted their realtor to discuss selling the house. The realtor made a group message including both Chris and Shanann so that they could all discuss the property. At one point she comments that Shanann hasn't really weighed in on the conversation and Chris replies saying that Shanann hasn't been around all day. I'll pop the text messages on the screen if you would like to pause to read. Nicole Atkinson, who had dropped Shanann off from the airport the night before, had been texting Shanann all morning but wasn't getting a response. She knew that Shanann had been feeling a bit down in the dumps and that she'd had a doctor's appointment that morning so being a good friend she just wanted to check up on her. Nicole had been sending text messages since before 9am that morning and although Shanann wasn't answering was a little bit weird she didn't initially worry but as the hours went by and text after text went unanswered Nicole knew that something wasn't right so she and her son got in the car and drove over to the Watts' house at about 12pm. When they Arrive, Nicole knocks on the door and looks into the house but it is empty and silent. She texts Chris expressing her worry that she hadn't heard back from Shanann all morning and that she's at their house knocking and no one's answering. Chris makes up an excuse saying that Shanann has gone on a play date and basically tells Nicole to go away. Nicole looked in the garage and saw Shanann's white Lexus which was her only car and it still had the car seats inside. Nicole knew Shanann and she knew that she would not take the girls out without their car seats so this was really off. Nicole again goes to the door and pays inside. The Watts's have a ring doorbell so when she approaches Chris gets a notification sent to his phone. When he sees this notification, he rings Nicole and tells her to go away and she responds saying that she's going to call the police. This makes a shiver run down Chris's spine and he tells her not to. After hanging up on Chris, Nicole rings the doctor's office where Shanann was supposed to be going for an appointment and the receptionist tells her that Shanann was a no call, no show. At this point, Nicole is full of worry. This is not like Shanann. Shanann would never miss an appointment, especially being a no call, no show. At this point, she doesn't care that Chris had told her not to call the police. So she dials 911 and requests that an officer comes and does a welfare check on Shanann. She then contacts Chris and tells him that she has called the police so he starts to make his way home. When the officer arrives he's met with Nicole and her son and Nicole begins to relay her worries onto the officer. The officer advises her that he can't force entry into the house so he basically does what Nicole has just done. He knocks on the door, he calls out Shanann's name, he does a sweep around the property. At one point he shouts over to a neighbour who's in their garden as asking if they've seen Shanann but just like when Nicole done it all of this turned up nothing. One thing that he did notice was that the door was locked from the inside meaning that whoever left did not leave through this door. Nicole is now on the phone to Sandy and she's relaying her worries onto her. She's asking Sandy if she knows the code for the garage because they can open and get into the house that way but Sandy doesn't know the code and the feature is broken on the garage for that in any ways. Chris eventually pulls up and introduces himself to the officer shaking his hand. He doesn't seem rushed, worried or in any sort of hurry. He opened the garage door and went to the Lexus and started kind of looking around in there. It was immediately noted that Chris didn't call out their names, he didn't shout to see if he was going to get a response, he didn't rush into the house to look for them and it's thought that he probably's only locked in the car to gather his thoughts and just to stall for a couple of extra seconds. Chris's actions are not really reflecting the act that he's trying to put on. You would think that he is filled with urgency, he wants to know where his family is, 
you think it would be a natural instinct for him to come in and just start shouting their names desperately hoping that he hears one of them shout back but Chris does none of that and that's because he knows they're not in the house. Chris opens the front door and Nicole lets herself in and he gives permission for the officer to come inside as well. The officer has a quick look round and initially nothing looks out of place, actually the house looks quite tidy. The bed sheets from Shanann, Bella and Cece's bed are all gone and it's Chris that mentions that the girls' comfort blankets are gone too. Upstairs, Shanann's phone is found and it's switched off which is an immediate red flag. Shanann's phone was her lifeline, she never had it turned off and she would never ever leave the house without it. When it's switched on, it blows up with tons of missed calls, worried messages from other friends, from Nicole Atkinson and then from Chris himself. Chris walks into the bedroom and then he casually emerges from the bedroom holding Shanann's wedding ring. Nicole finds Shanann's bag and starts to look through it and inside the bag she finds Shanann's medication. This is another really big red flag because this is something Shanann cannot possibly part with. You can watch all of the police body cam footage of all of this happening and throughout it's very evident that Nicole is super super worried. You can just see it in her facial expressions. A neighbour of the Watts's named Nathaniel tells the officer that he has a CCTV TV camera that looks onto the street and he's welcome to come and take a look at the footage. Both Chris and an officer head next door to watch. The footage shows Chris reversing his truck up to the garage and loading items inside. Because the footage is sort of grainy you can't really make out exactly what it is but in hindsight we know that it was Shanann's body. The CCTV captures Chris driving off and then nothing relevant after that. It doesn't catch Shanann and the girls leaving for a play date like Chris had told Nicole. While watching the CCTV footage, Chris's body language is speaking volumes. He's initially nervous, looking down on his phone, he's swaying from side to side, he's got his hands on his head, he's sweating, he knocks his sunglasses off and he's over explaining to the officer his reason for backing the truck up into the garage. This is something that he never done, he would always keep his truck on the street because sometimes it would like oil and Shanann didn't want the drive getting dirty and stained. So when Chris pulls it onto the drive it's something that sticks out to Nathaniel. When Nathaniel shuts off the CCTV it just goes back to regular TV and one of the first adverts that comes on is an advert for the new season of American Horror Story. This ad shows a baby in a womb and then it pans down to a heart in black oil. Many people believe that this is Shanann sending a message from the other side telling them that her babies are in the oil tanks. Obviously not everybody believes in that sort of stuff but personally I do. But like I say there will be a lot of people that don't but it's really hard to deny what a coincidence that is. Upon seeing this ad Christopher then tells the officer about Shanann's pregnancy. Chris then eventually leaves and he goes by himself after the officer tells Chris he's just going to get Nathaniel's information. As soon as Chris is out of sight, Nathaniel turns to the officer and says, quote, he's not acting right at all. He elaborates that Chris's demeanour is just off. He's never usually fidgety and rocking back and forth and ordinarily Chris is quite quiet and still quite reserved but just there he was being chatty and even blabbering a little bit which is just totally out of character for him. The officer takes in this information but he does advise Nathaniel what Chris is going through at the minute and just tells Nathaniel to put himself in his shoes. Maybe that's why he's a little bit off. That night, Chris gets to work erasing any trace of Nicole in his phone, their call logs, their text messages, etc. That night, he spends 51 minutes on the phone to Nicole. The day after their disappearance slash murder, Chris receives a phone call from the police department just wanting to get information about Shanann, Bella and Cece's appearance. So height, weight, eye colour, hair colour, any scars, any tattoos, etc. It's noted that when the police department made this call, Chris never asked if they were calling because they had found the girls and he didn't ask about any progress in the investigation. 
police begin to do door-to-door -door inquiries. They hand out flyers, they stop cars, and they just generally ask people if they've seen anything and if they haven't, just to kind of keep an eye out. The police also take a canine unit to the Watts' house to see if they can pick up a scent or anything. Local news arrive to kind of interview Chris and give him an opportunity to plead for his family to come home. After these interviews, many people all across the country would begin speculating about Chris's involvement. Throughout his interviews, he stands with his arms crossed, his voice is shaky, he kind of sways a little bit, and he actually smiles many times throughout the interviews, but never once sheds a tear. One of the reporters straight out asked him, where is his family? And he smirks and replies saying he doesn't know. He's asked by a reporter if he thinks that Shanann and the girls have just kind of taken off, and he responds saying, quote, I mean, right now, I don't even wanna just like, to throw anything out there. I hope that she's somewhere safe right now and with the kids. He goes on to say, quote, but if someone has her and they're not safe, I want them back now. Like that, that, that's what's in my head. If they're safe right now, they're going to come back. Nicole Atkinson talks to the news and she is very much the opposite of Chris. She's crying and she speaks directly to Shanann pleading for her to come home. This day, Nicole Kessinger, Googles Shanann's name and she also Googles about police being able to trace and recover deleted texts. When Chris is formally questioned by the FBI, they ask him to elaborate on the emotional conversation that he and Shanann had just before her disappearance that he had previously mentioned. Chris explained that while Shanann was away in North Carolina, that really gave him the opportunity to find out who he really was and that he really found himself and when he was reunited with Shanann, he just couldn't feel their spark anymore. He told Shanann that he wanted to separate and that he didn't love her anymore and this is when Shanann supposedly backfired saying that he wouldn't see Bella or Cece again. The agent asks Chris what his gut is telling him. He said that he initially thought Shanann had taken the girls to a friend's house to blow off a little bit steam but he's not so sure now. After all the searches, all the news broadcasts etc and he now believes that someone has took his family. He knows that there's no sign of forced entry or any sort of struggle at the house so he makes a point of saying quote If someone took her it had to be someone that she knew because there's no sign of anything like being disturbed or broken. During this interview, Chris also denies that he has had an affair. It's noted that Chris has virtually no marks on him. He's got no scratches, bruises or scrapes or anything to indicate that he had been part of a struggle. Shanann's dad, Frank, later said that due to the lack of abrasions on Chris, he believed that Chris murdered Shanann while she was sleeping because she was strong and she was a fighter and she would have fought for her life. Chris later confessed to drugging Shanann with more oxycodone and he had waited until she was physically unable to defend herself to begin strangling her. On the 15th of August, Chris is asked if he will take a polygraph test, which is just like a lie detector test, and he agrees. During the test, he is asked several questions, including, do you know where Shanann is now? Did you physically cause Shanann's disappearance? And are you lying about the last time you saw Shanann? Chris obviously fails the polygraph, but he is not budging. He is still adamant that he played no part in the disappearance of his family. He does eventually admit to cheating on Shanann, he tells the agents about the first time he laid eyes on Nicole and how she had, quote, took his breath away. He also said that for the majority of the five weeks that Shanann was away, he spent most of his time with Nicole. Going back to Shanann, after Chris admitted the affair, he said, quote, I didn't hurt her. I cheated on her. I hurt her emotionally. By the time Chris gives up his relationship with Nicole to the FBI, they were already well aware of the affair. And that's because Nicole told them. Nicole Kessinger was interviewed by the FBI after she approached them, telling them about her involvement with Chris. She claimed to be worried about Shanann, Bella and Cece, and according to her, it was from the news broadcasts that she found out Shanann was pregnant. Like I said earlier, Chris claimed to have told Nicole about the pregnancy when she was in his house, but according to Nicole, she didn't find out until the news broadcasts, so it's whoever you want to believe. 
she tells the agents about how she and Chris had met at work, how he approached her and she saw he wasn't wearing a wedding ring and she found him attractive. She admitted to eventually knowing that Chris did have a wife but she was under the impression that they were divorcing. She tells the agent how Chris already having kids did make her feel uncomfortable. She wanted her own family and all of her own firsts but supposedly she had never expressed this uncomfortable feeling towards Chris. It was said that Nicole had told Chris that she wanted to give him his first son and that this statement had further motivated him to commit the murders. Throughout the questioning, Nicole is very monotone. She very rarely uses Shanann, Bella and Cece's name when she's talking about them. When talking about Chris, she said, quote, I legitimately think his cheese was sliding off the cracker long before he met me. Back in the interrogation room with Chris, the agent challenges him why he hasn't cried. His girls are missing and he supposedly cried during this emotional conversation with Shanann, yet here they are where they are missing and he doesn't know where they are and he is dry eyed. Chris tearfully asks if he can speak to his dad, Ronnie. The agents bring Ronnie into the room and leave the Watts men telling them that there's no rush. Eventually, after a short while with his dad, Chris says that he no longer wants to protect Shanann and admits to murdering her. He justifies the murder by saying that after their argument, he saw Shanann strangling Bella and Cece on the baby monitor. He ran to the rooms and saw that both of his girls were blue in color and that he blacked out in rage, lost control and strangled Shanann in retaliation. The FBI agents come back into the room and Chris relays this false story onto them. He also adds how he had disposed of their bodies at Survey 319. While relaying this, he's now hysterically crying. Eventually, the FBI agents give Chris a drawn picture of Survey 319 that had been taken that day and ask Chris to point out where everybody is. On the photos, there are three markings. S for Shanann on some disturbed earth, B for Bella in one oil tank, and C for CC in the other oil tank. Four days after her murder, police were able to recover the body of 34 year old Shanann. She was found with the fetus of her unborn son, Nico, in her underwear after suffering from a prolapsed uterus brought on by her death. Sandy was contacted to ask if she could aid in the formal identification. She asked only two questions. Is she beautiful? Does she have black hair? When the person on the phone replied saying yes, Sandy then said, quote, then you have my daughter. Officers get started on recovering the bodies of Bella and Cece, which is no small task. This includes having to drain the oil from the 400 barrel tanks. The day after finding Shanann, Sandy is then contacted to ask if she can help identify who they have found. Sandy begins to describe the girls as hair when she realizes that the beautiful, fine hair of her granddaughters would be drenched in oil. The officer asks which of the girls would wear a pull-up and this confirms that they have found three-year-old Celeste. Sandy told them to keep going to find her Bella and two hours later, they do recover Bella's body. Bella was only four years old. The family held a candlelit vigil to remember their three beautiful girls and their unborn grandson. Shanann, Bella, Cece and baby Nego were all laid to rest together on the 1st of September 2018 in North Carolina. The Watts family did not attend the funeral. On the 6th of November, Chris Watts pled guilty to nine charges, including three counts of first degree murder, two additional counts for two of the victims being under 12 years old, one account of unlawful termination of a pregnancy, and three counts for tampering with a body. Because of his plea deal and Chris pleading guilty, this meant that the death penalty was taken off the table, but the Ruzex never wanted to pursue the death penalty. Sandy would say, quote, he made the choice to take those lives. I do not want to be in the position of making the choice to take his. In court, both Sandy and Cindy made statements. During Cindy's statement, she turned to Chris and told him that she forgave him and that she loved him. She done this while Shanann's grieving, heartbroken family were in the room. Chris declined to make a statement. The judge commented saying, quote, 
This is perhaps the most inhumane and vicious crime I have witnessed out of the thousands of cases I have seen. Chris was handed five life sentences with an additional 84 years to serve. He will never set foot out of a prison wall again and he will die behind bars. When put in prison, Chris was placed on suicide watch and he was eventually moved to a different facility because of safety concerns. So he now spends his days residing at Dodge Correctional Institution, which is in Wisconsin. Before we wrap up today's case, I just want to give you all a little bit of extra details that I couldn't really work out where to fit in today's case. So the first thing I want to mention is how shady Nicole Kessinger and her Google searches are. As I mentioned many times throughout the case, Nicole had always proclaimed that when she initially met Chris, she had no idea that he was married. However, a search of her Google history would show that she had been Googling Shannon's name since September 2017 and many times before. But bear in mind, Chris had never approached that in work until June 2018. Following that, Nicole had always said that she didn't know Shannon was pregnant until the news broadcasts. But Shannon's Facebook was very public. You can still go and look through her stuff now. So you're telling me that when Nicole is going on her account and looking, she doesn't see all of Shanann's post about this new baby, one being the one that was posted on Father's Day. More of her shady Google searches, including searching Amber Fry's net worth. If you don't know who Amber Fry is, she is the mistress of Scott Peterson, who is currently incarcerated for murdering his pregnant wife. She even searched Amber Fry's book deals and she searched asking if people hated Amber Fry. As I mentioned, she did try to erase lots of text messages from her phone, which were eventually recovered, but apparently she even tried to destroy her SIM card as well. What does she have to hide? On the morning of the murders, Chris left his house at around 5, 5.30 a.m. And around an hour later at 6 a.m., Nicole's phone pinged off of a phone tower in close proximity to their house. Now, bear in mind, Nicole lives 20 minutes away, so she has no reason to be in Frederick or near the Watts' house. But do you remember when I mentioned the officer going into the house, he commented about how tidy it was. I could do a whole nother video on Nicole Kessinger and just how shady she is and all of her inconsistencies. There's literally tons. Many, many people think that she aided in Chris annihilating his family. I'm not 100% what I think. Chris would later say to one of his prison pals that Nicole murdered the girls, but I'm not so sure. What I do think is that Nicole did know about the murders, that she knew they were going to happen, but I don't necessarily think she participated in them. Comment down below and let me know what you think. One of the things that does stick out in my mind though is like, why was she in close proximity to the house on the morning of the murders? It's speculated that Chris ended up confessing so early and then pleading guilty so that they couldn't look into Nicole further. Apparently it's been said that as soon as Chris confessed and as soon as he pled guilty, investigators didn't have more power to investigate. I'm not sure how true that is, but that was something I just saw floating about. Either way, Nicole has not ever been named a suspect or a person of interest. During her trip to Arizona, Shanann received this picture from Chris, where he said that Bella had put a sheet over one of our dolls. Could this have been foreshadowing the fate of the girls? Wildly, Chris has his own YouTube channel with over 1,500 subscribers. His profile picture is of him and Shanann and he has only one video posted where he is doing a presentation about relationship deterioration and repair. The Wattses did file for bankruptcy back in 2015 and were apparently super close to having to file for bankruptcy again. They had an income of just under $5,000 monthly and their expensive mortgage and their car payments ate up most of that, not to mention having to pay for both Bella and Cece to go to a private nursery. Throughout her first pregnancy with Bella, Shanann created her own blog where she posted tons of pictures. She posted progress of her decorating Bella room she posted when she bought Bella books dates that her and Chris had been on and she spoke about Bella kicking her she posted pictures from her baby shower it is a super cute blog 
And that is today's case. If you've managed to stick around for this long, thank you so much. I have linked all of my social media in the description box below if you would like to follow me on any of my other platforms. Like I say, I do cover true crime cases on my TikTok as well. I have also linked all of my source material in the description box too. If you're not already subscribed, please do so. I would really appreciate it. I appreciate all the support that you always give me. And don't forget, you can click the little bell button so you'll get a notification every time that I upload. Comment down below and let me know what you think of these longer videos. Do you like them or do you prefer kind of the shorter videos? Thank you all again for the continuous support. You just have no idea how much I appreciate it. I literally appreciate it so much. So thank you all so much again and I will see you all in my next one.